Hey everyone, can you guys hear me? Hey Agna, yes. Okay, just give me a second. I'm gonna actually try to <clears throat> give everyone privileges to ask questions. So. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So if you guys want to ask a question, you guys can just place press star six and um, unmute yourself. And we're gonna get started. So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I would like to introduce Ting Pen. She will be speaking to us about financial management. Um, and I think she's going to tell us a little bit more about herself before she goes on and uh, gives us all the good stuff. So um, take it away, Ting. Thank you, Yagna. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. In that case, then I'll get started. Thank you all for joining. Um, I thought I'd just started with giving you a little bit of background about you know, where I came from, I went to school, so you guys can understand sort of the context and perspective I'm coming from. So I went to high school actually with one of the founders of Deep Mentorship, and she asked me to speak with you guys about financial management. It's something that I'm like super, I'm like very passionate and have like lots of opinions and thoughts on. Uh, so I went to side together and after that, I went to Georgetown University. My first job at college was actually at Citigroup in Manhattan. I stayed there for a couple, a couple of years and then I decided to quit and travel the world for a little bit. After about a year or so of like traveling and Going around, I started a company. And this is actually very different for me because I, growing up, my parents immigrated to the US and they were entrepreneurs. So I could see day in and day out like how many risks they were taking and for like whatever kind of like financial reward or cost they were uh, getting. So I grew up like very financially risk diverse and I've always been like very sort of practically minded, but I can understand you know, both sides of the equation. But that's what I'll talk to you guys about and share some of my thoughts on that. So why don't we get started with the first slide on the presentation, which is just a very simple definition of what financial management is. Right. So you can see how Wikipedia describes it in the context of an organization. But for me and as an individual, financial management is really just the ability for me to juggle my income and expenses with an eye towards needy and future needs. So this typically and usually involves evaluating on some scale you know, the cost and benefit of a purchase or even just a an intangible and quantitative choice and deciding whether it's worthwhile for me to do now or later. So everyone stands a comfort point along this spectrum is going to be really different because everyone comes to the table with different circumstances and we've got different priorities and like different habits. So a simple example to illustrate this uh, would be you know, whether I'd rather spend my allowance or paycheck on a movie and a dinner with friends like today or tomorrow or save it towards like a future bag or some other more expensive expenditure that I would want to buy. Like a more complicated example would be, you know, what, what I want to do with my first big paycheck after college. Should I spend it out on spend it on a night out with friends, rent a nice but expensive apartment, or start saving for retirement or make loan payments? You can see how like everyone's answers on this or everyone's responses or immediate um, reactions be different. So to the next slide um, where I highlighted a couple of you know, major financial choices and considerations high school students such as yourself would be facing. You either going to potentially be like looking for or evaluating paid or unpaid internships and jobs, looking at paying for college, whether you can apply for scholarships, get loans, or some other kind of financial aid. Or you can be picking on a picking a college major or a career. And um, so there are a, let's move on to the next slide. Um, I thought, you know, each of these 
major financial considerations has like a whole world of um, sort of considerations and its own, like uh, their own variables to consider. So what I've done here and what I've decided to do to just focus the webinar some more is I'm going to give you some resources that you can use for like finding internships or financial and you have like much more experience and firsthand um, stories and anecdotes we can share for that. So those are just a couple of uh, resources I found in talking to like my friends or in like looking up online. You can feel free to peruse those at your own leisure and pace. I'm going to be focusing really the extent of uh, the most of this webinar on um, you know the role of like financial management or taking a more financial management approach to choosing your college, major, or career. So I guess we can take a step back, step back here and talk about, you know, why is it important to consider finances? Well, you think about it. It's really the biggest financial decision or investment you and your parents are making soon or like at some immediate juncture or even currently right now. You look at this, like the college board is reporting data saying that tuition, room, and board um, for private schools in 2005 was 35000 In 2015, it grew to 44000 For the equivalent four-year public school, it was 15000 about 10 years ago, and it's now 20000 in 2015. So that's about a year-over-year -year growth rate of 2 to 3%. In fact, um, compared to a decade ago, it's 25%. It costs. 25% more now to go to a private university, and it costs 32% more to go to a public university. When I went to Georgetown, I remember tuition room and board being about $30,000, and my niece, who just started Georgetown this past year, her tuition room and board now that the school is publishing is $60,000, and that's more than doubled in price. And you know, as an aside, even though private schools might seem more expensive, as my friends have actually had the experience where like they still went ahead and applied for it because one of the other things that private schools have is access to more grants and private endowments that they can disperse to students who are entering. So the worst case scenario, which was actually a reality just a few years ago from like 2007 to 2011 recession, but many students and new graduates were entering the workforce with a ton of debt and they had very a very difficult time with finding a job to like pay these bills. The Wall Street Journal was reporting on average that um, debt, the debt level for the 2015 graduating class was the highest it had ever been and amounted to about on average 35,000. And of course this is blending the extremes of like people who entered college on full rise or had wealthy families all the way to those who had to like borrow their way through to pay for education. And you know, and on the other hand, some people think that the traditional four-year liberal arts college is no longer worth it, and they actually support going straight to technical or vocational schools that teach hard skills, like Germany and some other European countries work on this philosophy too. So there are lots of like different ways of um, sort of approaching this college question and financial management. And so that was a very cheerful note to kick things off on, but it just shows financially what's at stake. But what it really comes down to is, what do you want to show for it? And like, what is it worth to you? You might be lucky and you have several sources you can rely on to pay your way through college. Or you could be graduating with a lot of debt that you need to shoulder in the future. Right? This isn't to say that you should only consider jobs that have high salaries, but that you'd be miserable doing, or that you won't be able to get by with a nonprofit, uh, nonprofit job or career. You can still pursue a fulfilling or social conscientious career and get by. And paying for college and taking on debt in and of itself isn't bad. I would just urge you to make the most of what you can. Ultimately, you just have to balance what you're committed to, what you're interested in, what you want to do with your future earning prospects, future loans, and be comfortable with the trade-off risks and opportunities there. So that was kind of the introduction, and I'll break it down a little bit more. So this whole concept, right? There are generally two schools of thoughts like when it comes to colleges, careers, and like majors. One is that college should prepare you for a career or a job. And the other is that college is time to explore and get a well-rounded education. So 
So let's go through the financial management or considerations of each of these paths. First, college prepares you for a career job or graduate, uh, graduate degree. So if we wanted to adopt a, financially, um, a financial management perspective on this, the most logical way to measure your success or the return on your college tuition investment is if you can get the job you want or the career that you want. That's what you should maximize for, and that's what you should solve for. And you can kind of see this in the case that you, know, you will be spending or investing about $60,000 or uh, forty dollars to $60,000 a year on a college degree. You should have something worthwhile at the end of it so that you can either pay it off or um, can move forward. Right. So one of the things that you could do to maximize and solve for it is, well, if you have an idea of a career in mind, look at the college you're considering and check out the career center. Right? Look for the names of companies and organizations in those fields. Are the types of jobs like you actually want to apply for getting posted there? Do those kinds of companies and organizations attend the school's career fairs? Are there many postings um, that's for the type of job or like even similar jobs that require your skill set on the school's website. For example, my co at my company, we generally tend to steer clear of like large job sites like Monster. And we post directly to schools and we select or we highlight certain majors that we're interested in receiving applications from. Another factor you can look at is, are there a lot of alumni on LinkedIn who have gone on to do this job for at the school? So it's always a good sign when, um, you know, Alma Mater, when you are a recruiter, you generally tend to feel more affinity for your alma mater. So one of the top places you'll think about is you'll go to your old school where you graduated from to like hire and post for more people. And as a student, that's good for you because you have a network of people who have shared the same college experience as you potentially will, and they'll be much more likely to be receptive to any of your questions for help or any of the requests for mentoring. Of course, these aren't definitive questions. They merely just give you a sense of the existing network and infrastructure and existing support for your field. So you can get a sense of how easy it might be to launch a career in that area, or if there's not that much support around it and how much of an uphill climb you might need to make up for. For example, I had a friend who attended the University of Maryland and who was very interested in pursuing financial careers within investment banking or consulting. But unfortunately, he found that there weren't a lot of companies that went to his campus on UMD to um, participate in career fairs or to conduct on-campus interviews or to post many jobs there. So he actually had to go out of his way to come over to Georgetown University and attend the career fairs and like the various um, career workshops and uh, networking events that was hosted on our campus. So that just goes to show you know, kind of how important it is for you to ideally line up where you're going into as a job and like where you can apply to school for and where you accept, get accepted at. So working backwards from that career point, why do you actually want to uh, pursue a certain career if you have one in mind? Or what career should you pursue? So this is unfortunately a bit more kind of amorphous, right? It's best just to always Speak to various different, as, as many people as you possibly can to like gather more information, like research what it really is. Right? So talk to your professors. And in addition to your professors, make sure to speak to people who are currently in the field or those who have left the field and like switched out. So that way you get yourself a balanced view of the pros and cons. Right? I was a double major in accounting and finance. And so I was kind of torn for a long time about whether I wanted to be an accountant or whether I wanted to be like a financial analyst or some other profession on the finance career track. I went to my professor, and I, my accounting professor, and I asked him, hey, so what do you think I should be, like an accountant or a finance analyst? And my accounting professor says, you should be an accountant. Like these are all the reasons why you should, and like being an accountant is awesome. And then I went to my finance professor to get his perspective, and he's like, oh, you should definitely go into finance. Right? There's so many more opportunities, and like here are all the pros. So people always have their own kind of perspective that they bring to the forefront when they talk to you. That's why you get like talk to a bunch of different people and find out what it really is like. Are people who switch jobs like why did they do it? Like was there something they really dislike about it? At times, you know, people are more predisposed towards sharing like the positive side of things, and so you have to like dig to see like what the negative things are. There are also a lot of online resources, right? Like for example, if you wanted to be an actuary. You can search for things like, you know, how to become an actuary, 
what it's like being an actuary, or some related jobs to that degree, how to get a job as an actuary, what do they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, or how to advance and progress in a career as an actuary, along with other advice and resources. Um, one other important thing that you can do to bring more of a financial management discipline to picking a career is to look at and review the salary stats and the number of job openings there are for the career major you're considering. There are a lot of resources for you on this, um, on this and at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They released this handbook called the Occupational Outlook Handbook that shows you, you know, like what the growth prospects are like for this career field and like what's actually available there. So let's say, um, let's say people are interested in becoming reporters. So I looked this up earlier today. The median salary for a reporter or a correspondent or a broadcast news analyst is $37,000 a year. And uh, the job outlook over the next 10 years is actually dropping by 9%. So they're going to be they're projecting about 4,000 to 5,000, I believe, fewer jobs in the overall economy in the U.S. in this field. Right? And the industry itself is changing. So there was a traditional focus on print, um, print work. So you have like newspapers, magazines that actually get printed, and, and people are subscribing to them, and they get delivered to them. And there's a shift now more towards digital sites. So places like BuzzFeed and Business Insider would be digital news, uh, news companies that would hire reporters or correspondents. But they're, the two companies or the two groups of companies are very different. So you just want to know what you're getting into. And now let's go back to the meeting side point. You have to decide whether like this is worth your while. Is that okay for you based on where you want to live or the lifestyle you want to maintain? For example, you could make that work in New York City if you're willing to share an apartment or live at home and commute for a longer time. And you could also cook a lot, you don't go out a lot. But if you love going out and hanging out with friends or you have expensive hobbies or a collection you like to maintain, without generous parents, it's going to be a lot more difficult and stressful just to make those ends meet. Without having to like, pay off your student loans, a whole other decision and area of like uh, consideration altogether. There are also places like Glassdoor where you can look up salary statistics. Um, you can also look up more detailed statistics at the Bureau of Labor Statistics for their Occupational Employment Statistics Report. And I'm reiterating these multiple points um, because. I, so at a company, you know, we have various like, research analyst job postings that once in a while. And there was this anthropology major who I interviewed who I was considering for the research analyst position. And you know, anthropology to me has always been something that's like, really interesting, but I never really considered pursuing as a career. And the reason why is that it's, I didn't think that there was something that was like employable, which is very important to me. Or that was not employable, excuse me, let me uh, clarify. It's just difficult to find a job there. And that was kind of the sense that I got from the anthropology major too. Like he had two uh, short-term jobs and he was constantly looking for work because what he wanted to do did not get posted that often or there weren't that many companies that had positions open for what he wanted to do. Uh, there's this one time he was doing field work all the way out in Africa where he was basically monitoring chimpanzee uh, population movement from place to place. And so he would literally go and check out and count chimpanzee droppings, and, uh, its dung droppings, just to make sure, you know, uh, to monitor where population was moving and migrating. This is stuff that interested him and that he was willing to do, but unfortunately opportunities like that pop up very rarely. And so when you're deciding on a major, which I'll talk to you in a, a little bit later too, if you should take a look at like, both the availability of the types of jobs you'd be interested in going into, as well as like, what they pay for you. And I also want to say, don't do something just because you're going to be making a lot of money. I don't want to give you that impression. If it's not a career you can enjoy, find challenging, or even interesting, or you don't mind doing the job itself in some facets, you're not going to be happy, and it's going to be resting heavily on your mind every day, right? So for example, um, investment banking or consulting, uh, those are some of the very popular career paths um, at college when I was graduating. 
because they tend to be some of the higher paying jobs right out of college. And of course, you know, being a doctor is always something that people and parents aspire for their kids to achieve. But being an investment banker or consultant means really long hours, stress, and sometimes the travel. As an investment banker, you're going to be making a lot of money compared to other, you know, entry level jobs like right out of college. But you're also likely going to be working from 10 a.m. to midnight and past that. You will be putting all nighters. You'll be canceling a lot of dinners and you'll be potentially losing touch with a lot of your friends. And so you're going to be making money, but there are all these other considerations and cons on the other side. If most consultants fly out Sunday night to, if they're working on site, they fly out Sunday night to like a the client's location, like the middle of America, and then they work there for the entire week and they fly back Friday night. So this constant travel does wear you down, and you're only in your own apartment and home territory for two days out of seven, out of every week. Now it's going to be backwards. You know, it's something I see a lot, and along with my friends too, right? Everyone considers becoming a doctor because you know, that is one of the higher ideals and standards that sometimes parents can set you up with. But unless you certainly want to become a doctor and you can't imagine yourself doing anything else, please consider other options. It's grueling work. There are many years of studying, exams, and sometimes you'll have to pursue additional fellowships followed by residency. It's tough work and people get burned out and don't do it just because that's what your parents want for you. Do it because you want to do it and you're okay with those trade-offs and those cons. You'll be the only one living with that decision you know, day in and day out and it's ramifications all the time. On the other hand, you've also got like certain careers that require graduate school. For example, like teaching. I, had, I know someone who wanted to pursue a political science um, PhD and she was like very into the subject matter and she was really interested in teaching after she completed her PhD. But unfortunately, and no one told her this, is that there are only very, there are very few openings every year for political science teaching degrees that are permanent, right? So I was able to find some numbers online just to give you an example and an illustration of this. Um, sometime in 2010, right, um, the association published, uh, the PhD Political Science Association published some stats basically saying that every year, like a thousand students graduate with political science PhD, but only 48% of them get permanent academic positions. The rest of them either find adjunct or like other temporary research positions, but only 48%, that's less than half, are permanently employed in academic positions. It's this acquaintance of mine in particular she and her husband were both looking, uh, were both PhDs, and they were both looking to ideally work in the same location or the same school. And so that's going to narrow the field even more. Now, of course, she was gung ho about political science. So the risk of like potentially living apart and like these low numbers didn't deter her. So she wanted to go ahead with it, but she knew what she was getting into, and that was what mattered. Um, so overall, it's Overall, um, I would just say, you know, yeah, you just have to like balance your commitment or desire to that career with your earning prospects or future loans and just be comfortable with the risk downsides and trade offs there. And that should that basic statement would get you through a lot of things. So let's move on to picking a major, right? Um I so you've got your career. And the next step would basically be to like pick the major that would be the most efficient or effective at preparing you for that career and landing your job. I had a friend who um, had a degree in fashion merchandising. She went through like four years of schooling, and then after she graduated with that degree, she realized the actual work in fashion merchandising was completely different than what she'd been learning and studying, what she thought it to be. So she looked around and then she just wound up switching all together and working for a fashion department or a magazine. So if you're going to, if you've got this career in mind and you know what it's going to entail, then you should pick a major that's going to get you there and have a clear idea of what that path is going to be. Okay, right, well, what about a, what about the second path of, uh, of college and its purpose, right? getting a well-rounded liberal education and um, just learning and exploring and figuring yourself out. Like there are a ton of people who believe in this path or this purpose of college. And there's definitely truth there. 
college is a fun time. It's like the first four years of your life where you're sort of independent and you're away from your parents. And it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about anything you want to do or learn more about yourself away from some of the major influences in your life previously. If you don't know what, what you want to do, this is a great time to take classes or internships in different areas and use those four years wisely to get a better idea. Right? But then I always wind up thinking, you know, like, what is your plan after college? Are you going to be fortunate to have all your tuition or even your future expenses taken care of? If not, you could, in the worst case scenario, potentially be starting your adult life burdened with debt and have no clear-cut or easy way to earn money. It's just a bit harder to translate that kind of an experience into and sell it to a prospective employer on your resume and at interviews. You know, eventually, and eventually, you'll have to pick a major. And of course, because I'm still like financially risk averse and like very practically minded, I'm always biased towards choosing something that's employable for the sake of a return on your financial investment of tuition and room board and four years in college. I would actually advise you to have uh, at least one major or minor even that can be translated into a career path you're fine with. For example, you know, I once had this discussion with a reporter about the value of an education. He argued that college should be about pursuing your own intellectual interests and majoring in something that aligns with it. His example was philosophy. And philosophy was something that was very dear to him, and um, it also had the practical application of instilling some mental discipline and training people how to think through problems, question, and resolve them, which he thought would be a pretty decent foundation for future jobs. I can see how that works, right? Like studying philosophy, you are always, like you're constantly picking at things, turning them over in your head, thinking about reasons, and like working through different issues. But my perspective is just that ultimately, it's a bit of a harder uphill effort to get employed. You can definitely do it but and major in philosophy, but think about this, right? What companies are hiring philosophers, right? If that, even if, or what you could argue is that, like, I'm interested in majoring in philosophy, but I don't necessarily have to work in philosophy. That's a very valid point, too. Like if you're interested, if you're a philosophy major who's interested in working, and add a couple of examples here, like at an advertising agency, a merchandise company, a bank or even a healthcare company, you'll be competing against a ton of other people, right? And so would it be easier for employers to choose someone who has an advertising major, maybe a business degree or a health background or a philosophy background? The issue is that companies are swamped with like resumes for each position they get. When we post a couple of positions on um, you know various colleges' websites, we would get about like 10 to 100 a day so they're going through hundreds and thousands of resumes for each position they post, and you're going to be competing against others who are just as smart as you, but who might potentially have an edge because they've actually studied that or they have it listed on their on their um, resume. So my advice for these hypothetical students is go for those philosophy classes. You shouldn't deny yourself that, but try to either double major or minor in something that gives you, that has like an easier job uh, prospect or path ahead. If not, you know, consider some other backup plan or be willing and be cognizant that you might have to put in more effort to find a future job. Like you might have to spin or you might have to like tailor your resume for every different kind of job and uh, spin it some more so you can get, you can explain to your prospective employer like why it is um, that you're applying for that job, excuse me. Let's see. Uh, uh, I have a couple more anecdotes to share, but I wanted to first uh, move you ahead to, uh, so before I wrap up, I, I included a slide here with some resources at the very end, slide six, six, with some resources about just like how I track finances. And I wasn't really intending on going through these because I figured this would be something that you can peruse on your own to see if it makes sense for you. But I just included it there just in case so you guys can see and use it on your own time. And um, okay, so back to the main point, that, back to my main spiel. So you can still pursue something that's conventionally viewed as you know less financially stable. So some examples of these are becoming an actor or becoming a writer or working at a nonprofit. 
And you just have to be more on top of and be more flexible about like the financial management because funds, income, and earning in these areas are traditionally much tighter. You can definitely make it though. You might just have to look at alternate sources of work or revisit your expenses so you can afford to eat and sleep somewhere. There's, but where there's a will, there's a way. So you always hear about like aspiring actors right, who double up as waiters. They really want to become actors, but uh, you have to go to like fun, like a ton of auditions and you have to incur expenses for your portfolio, glamour shots, and or like even acting reels. And that doesn't always pay the bills sometimes, but these people make ends meet by working as waiters in downtime. Like that's how Brad Pitt made it through. But for every Brad Pitt, like there are always going to be maybe 90% of other people who have to ultimately pursue other uh, resources or just wind up working as waiters for a really long time. But if you're really passionate about being an actor and you can't see anything else that you can be, by all means, go for it. Just be, just be cognizant that you're going to have like a bit more of an uphill battle. Or even writers, right? Uh, I have a friend, I know someone who was a writer, and uh, he graduated from his master's in fine arts. And he's basically, he isn't able to find, like, his life goal is basically to like publish stories. But there's going to be a like, downtime between different stories, right? And so you've got to make, you got to pay for it somehow. So what he does is he applies for grants. Like he lives from grant to grant or like advance to advance. In the meantime, um, he's willing and his parents are willing for him to live at home. And like his parents pitch in to cover his expenses. And that worked for him. Like his one regret, like he's perfectly fine living at home. And his one regret is that, uh, and trade off, is that he's not really in a position to date. But given the balance of things, like that's a trade off and a give and take he's okay with. I, another acquaintance of mine, right, she loved to work, um, she loved her job working at a magazine, but unfortunately it didn't pay well. So she would make ends meet, and she was a hustler, she would make ends meet by shopping at thrift stores, reselling items online. She wasn't able to go out that much, and that was fine. She was disciplined about it. So she ate a lot of like sandwiches and ramen. She lived in a one-bedroom apartment that was con where the living room was converted into a second bedroom, and there were three other people living there. Cool with that. And she managed to save a little every month. You know, from time to time, like she wasn't she would see posts on Facebook, you know, for of like her friends and her family who were able to travel a lot and like go out and party, which she unfortunately wasn't able to do. She missed out a couple of like expensive parties and like nice restaurants, and she was okay with that. To her, she was happy doing her job. She loved it. She was happy with these other like trade offs that she made and she thought it was totally worthwhile. So what this goes to show is, you know, even if some of these choices or considerations might seem overwhelming to you, or, you know, just it's the only thing you can do is kind of just go, uh, just do the best with what you can now. Right? Life changes so much and it's impossible to predict how it's going to develop. In fact, like some of my friends who have been, who are similar to me, where they've been like very practically minded and very risk averse. They've taken the traditional jobs in finance simply because, you know, they, if there's good pay and they know what they can do, but it just does, it's not that fulfilling to them. And they've been able to justify it by saying, you know, all right, this, it's not the best. It's not the most thrilling. I don't wake up every day like ecstatic to go to work, but I am okay with it because this pays me what I am interested in to like live my own lifestyle to pursue my other hobbies outside of work, to have like a comfortable apartment, and that's okay. So it's just like a, it's just a homeostasis and like a very individual consideration that you have to kind of mull through on your own and uh, think about. And like one person's situation is going to be entirely different from like what you like to do or what you're uh, okay with and it's just, but you know, whatever your choice or like level of comfort, just give your options careful thought. Think through about the risks. Think through fully as much as you can the risks and opportunities. Ask for help. There are a ton of people who are willing to help you. And if you're at it, and if you can, have a backup plan. And I think that's really all that I wanted to share. 
I do apologize for the rant and the heavy focus on finances, but it is something near and dear to my heart, and I really wanted to share with you guys. So, um, Yakna, I think that's about it. Uh, do any of you guys have any other questions? Or questions? <clears throat> Thanks so much, Tang. Um, that was really great. Um, like I said before, you guys can press star six and then unmute yourself if you have any questions for Tang. So I have a couple questions, actually, Tang. Um, so one of the things that you said about picking the right major but trying to find a balance between what you like to do and what is practically going to help you like survive, um, you said that one way that you could get around that is by doing either a double major or adding a minor that could lead to a practical job. Um, can you comment a little bit about time management? Because clearly when people go off to college, there's a lot of social responsibilities that they also want to fulfill in addition to, you know, having a great academic yeah. record. Yes, of course. Uh, time management, it, it is definitely one of those things that uh, you have to, like, learn and balance in college. And so for me, I had a double major in Italian and finance. Um, luckily, I also had some advanced like AP credits that carried over, so he has a bit of uh, a on It's not going to be that much of an overlap, but at that point, right, is it more important to you to actually have those two degrees or do you all do you want to have more of like a social life? I think only one of the things I remember about like starting at five is that there's a saying that went around so you can only have two of these three things. You can have sleep like grasp certain concepts and like those two different majors or minors very easy, then you don't have to make that kind of a consideration. But if you find that you have to like study a lot, there are ways that you can still like study and be like social. You might not like sleep that much, but or you might have to like cut down on like procrastination, but you can definitely make it work. Like go to the library with friends and like have study sessions there. Or you can even um tag team with friends in those same fields, like block and tackle the course material. You know, um, you'll take one chapter, I'll take the other chapter, and then let's compare notes and let's like talk this through, or just give me your notes and we'll swap, and then we can basically cover the same ground in shorter periods of time. You do have to be more creative, and at some point there might, you might be like too over extended, but those are just some of the, like if it's worthwhile to you, then you'll make it. Thanks, Tang. I think Hazel tried to ask another question in the chat window. Uh, can you talk about mm -hmm. scholarship opportunities, students paying off tuition, and just usual payoff time for tuition after graduation? Let's go back to slide four, which is where I had initially included some of those things. Um, so for scholarship opportunities, I actually didn't have that many since, you know, back in the day, like about 10 years ago, there wasn't that much of a, like the internet hadn't developed to the place where it is now. So there weren't that many resources online. And I simply did not know that there were that many available scholarship opportunities. There were actually a ton. I was just looking the other day at like CapEx and SAS Web, and there are like 6,000 organizations or like 6,000 types of scholarships that are out there that people likely don't know about or might not be that diligent about applying for. 
there are a ton of places that you can actually look at online alone and like flip through see if it makes sense for you. And honestly, even if it's not like a direct fit for you, if it's not that much more incremental work, go for it and uh, go for it and still apply. Because I think I was reading somewhere online, um, like this one student had like no physical, uh, no physical affinity or like did not play any sports, but she wound up applying for and receiving like a sports oriented scholarship. So you never know what you can get. And in the case of scholarships, it's sort of you should just like try to apply for as much as you can and see what you get back. You'll never know, but if you don't apply, you won't be able to get it. Um, so this is, so there's like, you can get scholarships before actually getting into school. And while you're in school, you can, um, you can uh, apply for further scholarships there, right? Once you've identified like there's a major or a field of study that you're interested in, there's invariably, undoubtedly going to be some kind of professional organization or association of members in that field. And those organizations and associations usually have scholarship opportunities. So if you're interested in marketing, go look up the Public Relations um, Association or the Marketing Association. They have scholarship and money to give away. Or speak to your department chair or your professors. They might know of other opportunities that aren't publicized. They're in the field and they're in the network and they know these things and there are always resources for you to go to. Um, what else can I see about like scholarship opportunities? Um, all right, I don't know if there's anything else I can add about scholarship opportunities, but uh, for Hethel's second question about like paying off tuition during university, like I've never, I think unless you know your parents are really wor are really wealthy, like it's probably going to be. Um, rare for you to have or you have like a full ride it's probably going to be rare for you to be able to cover your tuition during university you can certainly get like a ton of financial aid if you apply for it and various scholarships if you expend some effort and it'll help to uh, go forward it'll help cover most of your expenses going forward when i was in college i also um, looked into like internships and jobs outside of the scholarship and financial aid field there's always like work study arrangements or miscellaneous jobs um, on campus. Or even if there are no jobs like being provided by the university itself, there are always jobs on like Craigslist or jobs that parents and other residents in that area will post at the university. So there are lots of opportunities there for you to uh, check out, to check those out. Um, I was lucky to get a work study placement and it helped to provide for a lot of like my own miscellaneous spending you know like going to wet seal and shopping or like ordering uh, deliveries when I was feeling really lazy about cooking it's sort of hard to talk about uh, the payoff time for tuition after graduation because of a couple of things you know most loans can be renegotiated or loans can be renegotiated to for the payoff time to like begin later and I think, if I recall, like my loan, my student loan, there was definitely a period of time where I was able to just focus on like building up savings and working before I had to like pay it off. So I actually, unfortunately, don't know too much about like loan payoff. And but I'll look around online and see what I can find, and then I'll email it to the organizers, and hopefully they'll be able to share it with you guys. I think I tried to answer most of Hethel's questions. Um, this other question about double major, or was it financially difficult? And the bank app list on the last slide is helpful. Okay, so the way it works in college is that, or the way it worked at least at Georgetown is that you pay a tuition amount every semester or for the year for a set number of credits. So let's say it's like 30 credits. That's basically like the balance you have to start with. Each class you take is about, I don't know, like three credits or so, let's say for example. So you could hypothetically take like up to, um, up to 30 credits worth like over the course of a year. So 
so each semester you might take like five classes, and each of those five classes were three credits, so that's 15 credits. So unless you actually take more than 30 credits, like you don't have to pay more in tuition. And um, I was quite lucky, lucky in that I did have some breathing room in those credit space because I was able to carry over some of my AP credits. So I took like a lot, I took the absolutely necessary classes I had to take to do my double major. And again, I was also pretty lucky because there were some overlapping classes within accounting and finance. So I didn't need to take uh, the required classes twice. So that freed up more credit room uh, for me. So I don't think it was that financially difficult unless you really want to take like, more than the credits that are allotted for you. And you know, even if you, um, the other thing you could hypothetically do if your double majors or minors are like vastly different is you can still take those the required classes for credit, but nothing is really stopping you from attending classes as an unregistered student. So if I were going to be really practical and I wanted to like maximize my college time, I would probably do I could do like two different majors and then finish up the rest of my core requirements. But in whatever free time I had, if I was interested in something that, you know, just for intellectual curiosity, I would just try to see if I could fit into my schedule and just attend and not take it for credit. That's another way you could do it. Or you could supplement it with like a ton of free online, um, there are a lot of like free online resources right now where college level or like even high school level professors will teach and host these webinars where they actually go through the concepts. You can even supplement it that way. Let's see. The bank app on the last slide. Which one? Had a couple there. Oh, okay. So bank apps are they are pretty helpful. Okay, so I bank with Capital One and T D Bank. So whenever anything happens on like my credit card or my checking or savings account, I get an alert. And this is really more so for my own um paranoia because I'm always it's just a weird thing that I have, a weird tick, but I'm always afraid people are going to steal you my identity. So I have alerts set up for everything. So anytime like a charge happens, I'll get a pop-up on my smartphone. Oh, such and such withdrawal happened, such and such charge happened. And if there's anything that I don't recognize, then I immediately call up the bank. It's just nothing has bad has happened so far. I've been quite lucky there. And um, that has worked out for me so well. This is only because of my only paranoia. <laughs> no one else shares the same concerns as I do about that. The one thing I do want to um, highlight, Cranbeer, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but it's the smartypig.com. Uh, it's a it's a website and it like basically links up to. Hold on a second. Let me go there. Refresh my memory. What I love about this is that it lets you um, it lets you categorize and organize your savings, right? So if I wanted to save up for a vacation, I could label one account, you know, vacation savings. Or if I wanted to, you know, like spring break is coming up, so I wanted to save up for that. Or if I wanted to save up for like a smartphone purchase, then I could label another account for that. And so every time I make a deposit into it, then I could see, all right, I'm depositing $100, and I'm every time I make a deposit, I want to set it so that 25% of it goes towards the spring break vacation, and 75% of it goes towards the, um, the smartphone purchase. So whenever I make the $100 deposit, 25 bucks goes towards my future spring break in uh, Miami or something, or 75 bucks goes towards my future iPhone when it gets released in September or something. It's really nice to see those balances grow and like the effort you're making towards them pay out. And it just helps to reinforce that ability to, yes, I'm saving, yes, it's doing something for me. You just kind of see it grow. It's just really satisfying. If you have a traditional bank, it just all goes towards like one savings account. And there isn't really a way to like break it up that you can't identify this is this dollar goes to that purpose and like this other dollar is for this other goal. So it's it's just like more information for you like as you're um, as you're going through it. There might be uh, what else I want to say here. 
Oh, you might also be talking about the Mint app. So I may as well just cover that too, Kanbir. Um, let me just pull it up right now. The Mint app is really useful in that it helps to basically track and monitor your expenses and income over whatever time period you start hooking it up. So it ties in with like your bank accounts, your credit cards, and your paycheck. And it shows you like over the course of a couple of weeks or a couple of months how your expenses are going. And then once you've got like a couple months of expenses or some time period of spending down, it suggests certain budgets for you to like keep track of, um, or certain budgets for you to spend every month if you want to spend as you were doing and not overspend. Or it will actually suggest certain savings goals for you to hit and the type of how you would have to change your budget in order for, uh, in order for you to actually meet those saving goals. So you can basically be like, I want to save a million dollars when I retire in 65 years. Oh, if that's the case, then Mint will suggest to you, okay, this is what you should be doing for your budget. This is how much you should be investing and how much you should want it to grow. So it does show a lot of that good information. You just have to play around with it and commit some time to like building up your profile of spending and whatnot. I hope that uh, answers your questions, Kranbir. If you have anything specific, please let me know. I will try to do my best to address it. I think we also had um, some further questions about paid versus non-paid internships. And this is a very interesting and like thorny issue. There are a ton of companies who post non-paid internships because they're basically trying to get you to do like the most basic menial and junior um, jobs or like tasks for free. And so what you have to ask yourself is like, you know, how much is this? But then there are other non-paid internships that really do give you a great leg up. So you really have to like look through the job posting and see what you're getting yourself into. If it's just filing folders and getting people coffee, you may as well get paid for that. That's not really building up your like career or your resume uh, and launch you to the next level. But if it's like an internship, unpaid internship where you're uh, shadowing someone or you're actually working on like meaningful projects that they need to launch then that's a great work experience for you and if you can you can you know uh, find funds elsewhere or have your parents to support you you can tighten your belt for a little bit and take on that unpaid internship because even though you're not getting paid like by the hour for it the investment of that time will pay off like a lot of dividends by making it easier for you to go for your next job in that area where you actually will get paid. So you'll be able to like put it on your resume, you have that experience, and you actually have something tangible and smart to talk with a potential interviewer or employer about. So in those cases, unpaid internships can be worthwhile. It sucks not to get paid, but it can be worthwhile because it'll just tighten your belt for a little bit now, and then in the future, you'll be paid more for it. Um, Paid internships, I think, at the high school level tend to be a bit more difficult because there are like lots of laws around, you know, hiring minors and um, hiring minors are basically people who are under 18. Uh, there are lots of laws around there, so there's lots of restrictions and people simply don't want to deal with it. Or you can get an unpaid internship with someone who just doesn't have like your best interests or your future development at um, in mind. And uh, you know. When you are in these unpaid internships, like they generally tend to be like either for a semester or for a set period of time, right? Like there might be a project that requires like three months of time, and so you'll just invest that three months of time in it. It really just depends on um, the employer and what you're getting out of it. Of course, you know if you're and if you're going, to, but if the project is going to ask for like a year's worth of your time and it's going to be unpaid. You can potentially, that, that's going to be a bigger threshold to like surmount, right? You could potentially take it and or consider it and do it for a couple of months. And after proving yourself, you can potentially even ask for more, uh, ask for some minimal, uh, minimum wage pay. That's not unheard of either. If your company values you and likes you, then they'll try to work out some kind of a solution for you. Uh, I think there's another question about 
taking AP credits with me. Um, so I, I actually don't know if you guys are in high school still, uh, what grade you are in high school, right? Uh, but you'll have these opportunities to take AP, what are called advanced placement classes. They're meant to be college level courses. So you could essentially take a college level course in high school for free and have and be uh, recognized for your accomplishment there and have it carried over to college. So the, one of the things I did was uh, AP credit, AP uh, microeconomics. And after I did like a, a year of that college level course, I took the advanced placement exam. I don't remember if I scored like a four or a five, but in order for it to carry over into college, you have to score at least a four or a five on that to prove you have some kind of mastery over the material. Then you basically, you get a sheet of paper from like your high school and you include it in your college application, or now that it's 10 years since I've um, since I graduated from high school, potentially it just transmits electronically. Um, so your college will receive. Okay, I see here that Ting Pen has gotten a four or five in microeconomics. That's great. This fulfills her economics requirement in college because you know in college you have to take certain courses. This will filter college economic her college economic credits uh, economic requirement excuse me in college, so she doesn't have to take that, which means there are three free credits in the example of you know three per class and like thirty in a year. There are now three free credits that you can um, apply towards any other class that you might want. So there's that. Like the AP credits will transfer over, and it basically frees up space in your um, class schedule in college, so you could take other classes. But then the trade-off of that is these classes you're taking in high school are a lot harder. They're meant for college-level students, so you're going to be studying harder, and um, you have to pass that exam, and it's going to be difficult. So like it might actually uh, you might find it to be very difficult for you, and it could you could be struggling with it. And so it might also um, it might also result in a lower score or a lower GPA or a lower grade than if you just took in the normal level. So there are like trade offs there too. I think those are all the questions that I've seen so far. Does anyone else have other questions? All right, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Ting Pan, that was really great. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions and um, all the resources that you pointed us to. Um, I think it was helpful for both Hazel and me too, even though we're no longer in college. So. Glad I could help and I wish you all the very best. If you have any other questions or you think about anything, please do not hesitate to like reach out to Yagna or Hazel and they'll get in touch with me and I'll do my very best to answer. Like no question is not important. So please ask now while you still have like that time and you're still considering it. I want the very best for you all. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope all of you have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.